it would be those moments when I'm in LA and me and my brother are staying in like a motel and I've lost everything and but I'm still doing music and spending all of my money and being broke as hell and out here that I felt a rush and like fulfilled and completely on point in my purpose. Welcome to Making Conversation with me, Grant Bryden, a podcast about music, creativity, and careers. For this series, I've sat down with a range of artists and creative professionals in order to learn about how their unique experiences and perspectives can help us in our own creative and business practices. For this episode, I spoke to singer and producer Baby Rose. She recently released her debut album, To Myself, as well as making an appearance on Self Love with Ari Lennox and Baz after sneaking into Dreamville's Revenge of the Dreamers 3 sessions at the beginning of the year. We talked about growing up in Fayetteville, North Carolina, learning to produce and engineer her own songs, and losing most of her recorded music during a breakup. Luckily, she had already sent a set of 10 songs to her management, which became the album that's brought her to London, where last night she supported Snow Allegra at a sold-out show at Shepherd's Bush Empire. I've just been starting all of the conversations basically with the same point, which is like, what's your earliest memory of music and of music having some sort of effect on you, like where you were conscious of it? I was at Christmas with my family and I think I was like four or five years old and my cousin Scott was playing on piano. He was playing Real Love by Mary J. Blige. And I don't know, the just sound of the piano just struck me immediately. And I was just like, wow, I'm in love. And so from that day forward, like my dad was very popular around DC. And so I would be at hell of people's houses and stuff. And whenever they would have pianos or like an instrument of any kind, I would automatically like draw to it. Right. I think everyone noticed that pretty early too. Like, you know, Rose really likes this shit. You know, so it's fire. But it was like the. It's interesting, I guess, because it's the the piano rend- rendition of it rather than the recorded original that you got into. Right. That's just my earliest. I've never had that. You know, I've never thought about that, but that memory always stuck with me. That was like my first memory, like of when it captured me. Um, Music always was around me because my mom, she managed a hip hop artist. And so there would be like producers in the living room set up with their keyboards and stuff. And my dad was like, into acid jazz and like house music and things of that nature and so i would listen to it on the way to school and on the way home and every time i was with them and my great aunt also lived in the house too and she was older and she loved like gospel hymns and so she would always hum it and so music was always around me and it was just normal like a facet of life that i just felt was just as normal as air but yeah that was when i knew there was something different with that moment what was the first music that you feel like because i guess you talked about the music that was already in the house the music that your parents were listening to and stuff but what do you think was the first music that you kind of brought from outside brought into the house that was yours hmm well when i i was always I knew I had a different type of voice early on because I was always teased by it, whether it was like my dad's friends, which was petty as hell because they were grown, or like kids in school. And so I think the first music that really I took to were from artists that had heavier voices that were contraltos. Um And just interesting voices. Like I remember hearing Janis Joplin and loving her catalog because it was so interesting, the texture of her voice and like falling in love with like the Muscle Shoals sound, like all of those artists, um, Mavis Staples and 
Um, that was my affinity in Amy Winehouse. She was crazy. I started to fall in love with the songs themselves because I also started writing before I started singing like poetry. And so, yeah, when I found artists that captured the two, like at an equally like rich quality, it was just like, okay, this is fire. Yeah. So for you, it was like specific songs and specific voices rather than like a certain genre or a certain sound that you were like, this is what I like. Absolutely. Yeah. So Absolutely. it was very like individual, mm -hmm. I guess. At what point, because I guess you, you've already just said that you were already writing and you were already making songs. What, at what point did you get involved as like a creator of music or sounds or poetry, really? Well, when I was, I think, six or seven, we always had um, talent shows at the Christmas dinners and things of that nature with all my family. And my talent would be like a poem. So my aunt um, bought me a journal and I would write all throughout the year. And at the end of the year, you know, during Christmas, I would read like one of my infamous poems or something. It was funny. Oh, that's funny. But yeah, that was like around six or seven. And then when I was nine, my uncle bought me a um, piano because he works as a truck driver, like a trash truck. Um, he has a business for that. And so he was cleaning out this woman's home, like renovating, and she had an old piano. And so he gave it to me when I was nine. And that changed my life because I just started teaching myself chords and like, you know, writing music, writing songs, putting my poetry to that. That was the catalyst. And then when I was 12, 11 or 12, we moved to North Carolina with my mom, my brother, and my great aunt. And I felt so alone there and isolated because we didn't have any family, it was just us. And so I depended on that piano for my solace, you know, my sanity. And one of my mom's friends heard me playing in the foyer and singing and was just like, Joyce, you have to take her to a studio. Like, I'll take her. She, this is a gift, whatever, whatever. And that was when it began. I started recording music and taking it seriously. Um, the the music that I had written already. So it was really like, it was a weird space in time because on one end I was 12 and so they were just like, you have to record music that makes sense for your age. But at this, in the other spectrum, right. I was making music that was really heavy, like that I didn't really go through, but I just felt inclined to do. So it was like, Hmm. How was that process of like being like nine years old and trying to teach yourself to, how how did you teach yourself to play piano? I just started playing chords. Um, I didn't have any real like standard technique. It was just listening to different music and playing it by ear, okay. like catching on. And then... um taking lessons on YouTube and things of that nature right. yeah, yeah, yeah. to like um, just whatever I had to do to like convey what I was hearing in my mind and translate it um, on piano because I heard everything before I would play it. Yeah. And sometimes when I'm at the piano, it writes itself like things will just spill out. Um how difficult is it, like, even now, I guess, because I know sometimes when you have an idea, it's like your taste level is in one place, but then your kind of, like, ability to execute it could be somewhere different. Like, how close do you get to actually being able to execute the exact thing that you had in your head? I like to keep it very simple. So it gets there. We get it done. <laughs> yeah. It gets done. I don't know how comfortable I would be like playing live without hella practice. But 
what is beautiful about what I have with my friends, like my friend Tim, who helped produce the album that I released, is like a virtuoso when it comes to piano, like studied at Morehouse, knows the ins and outs of that, like that's his expertise. And so I'll come with a very simple chord structure um, and he'll just, you know, do yeah. his thing and make it the appreciation, just make it very detailed and take it there. And so I'm like, okay, I'll stay in my lane because I'm still learning and growing and it's going to take time. Yeah. How was, so I guess we, we got into this move to North Carolina to Fayetteville, right? Yeah. I've been there before. Oh. So yeah. I know kind of what it's like, <laughs> but how would you, because it seems to be very like, it's like a military town, right? Right. Yes. And from my experience, at least, it was very, it was quite difficult to get around. Everyone's quite spread out. Well, my experience, because I was rarely on Fort Bragg, or the military base, my mom moved there really impulsively. Uh, I don't know what it was, the reasoning. She fell in love and wanted to be closer to the person she loved, but uprooted everything. And so my experience of Fayetteville was, was that it was very small. Yeah. And it was very slow, like quiet. And it was a small town. Like I grew to know the people that had been there, not just the people that were in and out, like going to different bases, but like that had been there for like generations. Your grandma lived here and your great grandma and all of that. And it was just like, <laughs> like this, is not, this isn't the wave. But in retrospect, I appreciate the fact that it's slow, that it was slower you know, the South, the Southern charm of it all. Because it made me very introspective and very like, I pay attention to the smaller things, yeah. you know? Whereas I think if I would have stayed in DC, I would just be very like, I don't know, maybe more quick witted and like street smart and all of those things. but. I don't know if I would take my time all of the time. Like Fayetteville really molded me in a lot of ways because I lived there for almost a decade. No, I didn't. I lived, I moved when I was 18, but like seven years. Yeah, but it's also like <laughs> seven like key years as well key though, right? Key years, yes, 11 to 18. So yeah, it was a different world. I loved it. And hated it at the same time. Yeah. And I don't feel bad about that because if you know, you know. If you don't, you don't. So you can't judge me. But if you know, you know. E. Smith was lit, though. What's the, that? That was my high school. Okay. That was lit. That was a lit experience because I remember moving to Georgia and my brother was still in high school. And so he went to a school in Buford, Georgia which is like predominantly white and their band just didn't hit the same. It wasn't the same energy. Like E. Smith's band was like flames and the dancers like, yeah. And the school dances, they were like more popping than like clubs. Yeah. Like my school was predominantly black it was fire. It was like the culture. And I, when I was coming from DC, I had went, my mom drove out of our district to make sure that we went to like some of the top schools in DC for public school. Um, mainly because DC has a really bad reputation. Like I think a few years ago, I don't know how the statistic stands, but only like 50% of kids graduate from high school right. or something like that on time. Yeah. And so she wanted to make sure that in our formative years, we had a really solid chance at like getting the best education. Right. But 
I was not prepared when I moved to Fayetteville to see, you know, the culture, like everyone's so brash, like honest, raw. And I was coming from elementary school in the middle school without the concept of what middle school was. And so I was automatically like just bullied off top. Like I did not stand a chance. Right. It was crazy. Were you in the school band? No, but I was in the choir. Okay. I was in the choir. I was in the show choir too, which you had to audition for that. Right. It was fire. What shows did, <laughs> What shows were you involved in? I mean, we would go to like nursing homes and different things. Like we would be able to take trips outside of the school to go perform. Right. Which was fun. They usually had like, I don't know. It was cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like food, we got fed and shit. It was cool. So when you were when you were twelve, and your mom's friend t- tells her that you need to be in recording studios and stuff, how do you how do you end up? Do you go into a recording studio when you're twelve? Yeah. And what was that experience like? It was fire. You know, I think I already had a vision of what I was gonna do. Um, I had this song called Dismal Days. And I already had the little chords. I would just play four chords. And I was like, okay, I'm going to lay this really quick. And then went in the booth. And it was just like, sang it through. And everyone was just like, whoa. (laughs) Like, she has a gift. This is crazy. And I was just like, oh. Hearing myself back, having a physical form of that, like, oh. Changed my life. It was lit. Because, I don't know, I immediately just started, I would go to these sessions and I would meet the engineer and producer and they were in like home studios in the beginning. And of course they had a rate in the beginning, but then they would just be like, it doesn't matter. The rate doesn't matter. Like she can just come and record. And so I um, started doing that and I was recording all the way up until like, 18 or so or 17 like in North Carolina so I had so many songs that never saw the light of day yeah which I appreciate that because I don't want every everything to be available online yes like those were years where I became versatile because I was told no like you have to experiment with this because you're young. Like, dim your lyrics, dim your emotions, try this genre, try this. In a way, there were negatives, but in a, a lot of ways, there were positives because I learned to be a versatile writer and empathize and, you know, yeah. stretch what I could do. And so, even though those songs will never be heard, thank the Lord. They were development. I feel like I was like Goku inside of the chamber, literally training. Do you think that? <laughs> do you think that that was a positive about Fayetteville though? Was because if you were maybe like in LA or something, you might have been this child star that they were like really trying oh, to yeah. push and all that. Whereas you got to be in a small town and like develop out of the sight of everyone. Absolutely. That is great that I was in Fayetteville. I would not, and I I used to be upset because I was like, you know, I was performing, I was on 106 in Park um, when that was a thing, doing like, you know, performing the first year I was 15 and I just did a showcase and I did a song that I wrote an ode to Billie Holiday that was called Summer Days. And that shit was crazy. Like, because I was in a small town, everyone went crazy, you know? Yeah. I went from being the quiet girl that, you know, sings at the talent shows and wins to, oh, shit, like, she's a whole thing. And so I did that. But the love that I got from Fayetteville early on, like, they put me in the newspaper and I was 
on the local news station and things like that. <laughs> and everyone showing me love. Like, I would miss so much school traveling and, like, recording or, like, performing places. Um, And they did not care because they had an absence rule. You can't miss more than nine days of school in a year. And I would miss, like... 40 days of school or some crazy thing but they were just like it's cool like but I would make A's and B's I was always on the honor roll so I think that it just worked out I'm glad that I had that space and time in a small contained environment away from everyone's eyes to really get those years that time of building and growing and making mistakes and signing bad contracts maybe like making really bad decisions getting out of them um and just growing and learning in the dark yeah but it also feels like that's a (laughs) a gentler and more supportive environment to be developing in than maybe like la where everyone's ruthless and everyone's trying to go for the same yeah. spot and stuff i think la gets a bad rep right um though because i went out there last year with my brother for the first time and this was because i had heard of an artist named Kadia bonet her catalog and it struck me immediately my friend put me on and i noticed that Itai Shapira had produced it along with her and so I reached out to him and he was like yeah we can set something up whatever and I was just like okay I'm gonna go out on a whim and I'm gonna go to LA and the vibe in that studio revival at the complex in LA used to be Earth Wind and Fire studio insane like I think the natives of LA are super chill and amazing yeah. like sid i went to sid's house from the internet she's amazing her mom was amazing you know Everyone, it's more the business side isn't it that has the bad rep not the like, not the um not the kind of creative community there yeah the creative community is incredible yeah yeah for sure at what point did you think that did you start to think that being a musician could be like a legitimate career option for you man hmm. i always knew that i had to do it i went to school uh i started college um and then when i started failing college i think that's when i realized like something's gotta give um i was going through a really low time in my life when my mom was sick and I had already kind of put music on a shelf because I hadn't had a plan or anything and I was recording so much music in Atlanta and various places, but I just didn't know how to formulate that into a career. So when my mom got sick and I wasn't doing well in school, and I was just working like two jobs, trying to pay bills because she was out of work and in the hospital for like months or at least like two months or something like that. I did a showcase because one of my friends did one at the school and I sang one song, it was a song I wrote called Bonnie and Clyde with a band and it just liberated me to the point where I realized like I can't give up, like I have to do this. I don't know how, but it'll find a way if it's meant to be. And so I just started recording music again with Case, who was like the producer of my first EP from Dust Till Dawn. And my brother shot a cover on top of a rooftop. My roommate was like the whole creative director of the project, like, we took an edible <laughs> and because I was going to name it some dumb shit. I don't even know what I was on, but I'm just good really for the music portion, like the engineering, music, writing, producing, all of that like is my forte or at least is where I feel comfortable in. But the visuals and things, 
I have no shame in saying like that is not my natural thing. And so we took an edible and she like helped me figure out the track list and the whole concept with everything and got me out of my shell with that. And I went to my mentor, uh, Mike Brinkley, and my mom, she had gotten well and I told her like, I'm gonna release this and I need advice. And so Mm -hmm. we put it on like all streaming sites but it was filled with samples, so it would keep getting taken down. I right. think it got taken down like three times. And then I realized, okay, this has to live on SoundCloud. Yeah. But that's fine. Like at least SoundCloud exists and will care for my baby, you know. But I have to start with um music that's sample free, that are original compositions. Basically, what I'm trying to get at is it's always been a perpetual movement of goals, like small goals. It's never been like, oh, man, like this is my career. I have to find a deal. I have to make this legitimate. Like when I made that intention of I only have this, this is all I have. Nothing else is going to work because... I realize you can fail at what you don't want to do. Like, I could fail at being a whole pharmacist and lose all of those years of my life putting that time and energy into something that was a backup plan. Mm -hmm. Um, And then lose my life on a freak accident or something like that. Like, watching my mom struggle for her life, you know, in ICU made me snap into really having a lust for life like wanting to live a very full life right and forget about all of the things that could go wrong and so yeah it's just been a perpetual movement of goals like finding my bandmates i worked at a smoothie shop and one led to another led to another like and we would just practice because we enjoyed to do it not because there were shows like I think I performed at this one bar maybe like 15 times and just little small places just because we enjoyed it and like we just split $100 at the end of the night like okay let's meet up again boys like we're just doing this and so you know also I kind of credit the fact that I was in a relationship where I had the room to not worry about financials because I watched this man go from like little hustles, like just enough to pay rent to like building a whole business. And like, I was sustained off of it. Like um, his friends around him were his closest peers, like, So I didn't think about money, but when we broke up, it was like, oh, shit. Like, (laughs) what am I going to do now? Like, I have to pay rent. I have to pay a car note. And all of these things. I have to be an adult, an independent woman. (laughs) And so, like, shows and sync opportunities and all of those things that independent artists thrive off of, like, eat off of became essential and gave me even more incentive to like broaden my spectrum and think of new um, ways to like be shameless, like just promote my music and broaden that view, you know? You mentioned before that you were recording a lot of stuff in Atlanta. Uh, what, What drove you to start working there and when did you first start going there so i moved to atlanta when i was 18 because i was gonna go to spelman i got accepted with a scholarship via georgia tech for biomedical engineering okay so i was on a whole different life path um i realized on moving day that my scholarship was no longer there because I came 
for the spring semester when I should have been for the fall. And it didn't work like that. They weren't going to, they gave it to someone else, I guess. And so when that fell through, I was really depressed for like four months. I was living at home, like taking care of my great aunt. And I just started tweeting various like creatives in Atlanta. Um, I didn't have my mom's friend as my manager anymore. I was just kind of like free. And so the first person I started really working with was Childish Major. Right. And it was really dope, like just creating freely, you know, because one thing I started to realize, even though the producers in Atlanta have a rep for trap music, it's a musicality underneath like his spectrum of music the samples that he chose were because his taste was really like in folk and like all of these weird like muscle shoals acid jazz and we would listen to all of that and i'm like yo this is fire and so i'm over here with all of these deep references as well these rich references and we would create just fire off skelter things and that went to slay the monster i started working with him and case i met him case boogie and me and case really honed in like that's like my big brother because for like four years man from 18 to like 22 i had known him and we were like in his attic creating the fiest music i mean there were duds they're hella duds but he allowed me that space of just whatever like his um the room was surrounded by records like right. old classic records and we would just sample and like use a white crayon to pick which samples and like the real on an mpc all of that and so yeah it was fire I just made a lot of music and I didn't know what to do with it, but I was happy to just do it. Yeah. And, um, yeah. At what point did you start to learn producing and engineering your own music? That was, mm, I had started early when I got uh, my MacBook, I think, God. 18 or 19 right but i hadn't felt confident enough to like really show anybody any of that it was last year actually okay. or this year earlier on and last year where i had like a plethora of sessions because of my wonderful team they just kept me in the studio at spotify secret genius room and like just calling different favors from different um, studios in Atlanta and most of the time there would not be an engineer in those rooms who'd be right. like okay she can have it for like four hours or six hours or whatever and so I would just like pull up Pro Tools a template or something and just start experimenting with like doublers and um, different reverb plates different like things that I could put on like just go get weird with it. I love yeah. to get weird with it. And um, my beats that I would make on Logic, I just started bringing them out the bags. I was like, you know, Case kind of went was just like to me, you know, I want you to broaden your spectrum of people who you work with, like get out of your comfort zone. And so I'm going to kind of step back to allow that room, which is big because apparently a lot of producers aren't on that. Like they're just like, no, you know, cause they want them production. Yeah. They're just like, stuff. no, but he was, Case is very spiritually. Like we would have many conversations that were beyond music and that were just very like about, the broader spectrum of life, you know? And so he's beyond the egotistical possession of people or thinking that that is even a thing. And so, which I love him for. But yeah, I would just be in there and I would just pull out my bag of beats and do my thing. 
one of my songs in your arms is like the one song that is completely produced by me and i have a lot of music but of course it's all pretty much deleted now yeah we'll get into that but um <laughs> but when you so when you first got the macbook was it what were you using was it like garage band and stuff or did you get logic kind of straight away did you know that's what you wanted to use I got logic straight away. Cool. Yeah. Case put me on game. Yeah. Yeah. It taught me those things. Do you think that that part of the, the kind of production and engineering part of your music, do you think that that gets overlooked when people talk about it? I don't necessarily put it at the forefront, but I want to like show exactly the methods behind how things are created with me and just squad in general because it's important like i think that artists have the ability to take it in their own hands how they want their story to be told if they're on that if they're yeah. true artists then you should have an autonomy about all of those things like you know and so in the past i looked up to artists like carol king when she self-produced tapestry and nina simone produced her music and was very much autonomous in what she did and like these days around me my peers like q is an artist from florida produces all of his stuff young baby tate produces yeah. engineers writes arranges everything and these are contemporaries around me and so i don't see it any other way i think that if you have a vision, you shouldn't leave that in someone else's hands. Like, it's your story to tell. And, you know, with this album especially, like, it's also, I'm not, you know, high and mighty, wear the crown or whatever. Like, uh, the people around me, you know, I look at us like scientists because we literally are in tune with like the frequency of what is supposed to be said it's yeah. a humbleness that comes with it like knowing when to step back knowing when to impose you know but having no ego involved like really just surrendering to what would make the song the greatest version and i keep my things very small and I trust everyone around me. Like, these are my friends. These are my genuine, like, they know. Yeah. Everything yeah. about me. And I love them because they empathize and find their own ways to relate. Like, the writers around me. I went from being it just me and Case in the studio and an addict, and it's just us. And I didn't go out. I didn't do anything. I was in a relationship and I was very much, this is my world, my little world, you know, to letting, allowing people in to my space and them being like angels for real, for real and helping me execute my vision. Yeah. So. Yeah, I just didn't, because I feel like with the producer thing, I, I saw... I went to Houston to watch Solange talking about her latest album and she was talking about how women rarely get the sort of like celebrated as being producers and engineers and stuff. Whereas like we'll have like a Kanye or a Travis Scott or whoever where we're like celebrating them as being able to like execute their whole vision. Right. Whereas she felt like people look at a female artist as a, as a singer but they don't look at the whole vision and everything that they've put in. Or that's some, that, that was a perspective she had on it. So I just wondered if that was something you'd felt with your work. Yeah, I, have, I don't... That is a true thing. You know, women are overlooked for a lot of things. Black women, especially, are placed in boxes and when the masses can't understand, they just, oh, it's R&B, it's this, it's a label, like it's a box. You know, not realizing that 
these genres, most of them were created, rock and roll, gospel, all of those things come from black women, black artists, you know what I'm saying? I think that there can be more of a light shined or shown on um, women in general who have that autonomy in their music, Yeah, you know? Because we make it for us, ultimately. Yeah. When we choose to be as vulnerable and like show our vision, that's a very personal thing to do. And it's a lot of work. Oh my God, like leading a band, making music, going through the mixing process, being there every day through it, you know, making sure even the smallest details are done correctly like in my mind like it it deserves to be credited for you know you obviously just mentioned the r&b and that does tend to be the kind of genre that's been associated with your music but i wondered is there is there even a genre that you that you clash your music as because it kind of feels like i guess elements of your music maybe you do fit into that but it also just kind of feels like it's its own thing it doesn't feel like it fits a specific kind of set of of guidelines yeah i think just how i don't know i i don't really identify with one genre you know i love r&b and soul a lot you know i appreciate it but I don't think that this album only identifies with that, you know? There are hip hop elements, there are classic just like songs that are stripped all the way down where there is no <laughs> drums on line, you know? Three of the songs don't have drums. We couldn't figure that part out. But it's also intentional, like, I don't know what I would classify it, it's a, it's a, a pot of different styles and genres and things, you know, m poured into one. I think the one thing that ties it all together is that it's an authentic thing to me. It's a body of work that was just real to me, but of course there's not a classification for that. Um, so I don't mind that, I just, It bothers me, you know, when things aren't understood, they're just kind of looked over, you know? And this isn't saying this about me. Like, yeah. I appreciate the fact that, you know, my work is paid attention to and even heard. And, like, being in London right now and, like, on tour and doing different shows where, it's just me and there are people that are there and they know the words and shit is crazy and lit. So I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying in general, there are a lot of artists that are on the border or on the cusp and they mix genres, but in the eyes of the masses of critics, of fans, of executives, of whomever, it's just, you're this. Yeah. Like, don't, that that is so disheartening. Like, just appreciate the music or not. Yeah. Whatever you go there, I don't know. But, like, just take it for what it is, you know? Yeah. I mean, when you mentioned the lack of drums, it, it reminded us of, like, Blonde, obviously, like a lot of people said with Frank Ocean was, like, why is there no <laughs> drums in any of these songs? But that's another good example, I think, of a, of an artist where people tend to sort of try and classify him as R&B, but like, I don't think you can really classify the album as anything. Exactly. It's just like you say, it's just kind of what he was going through at the time. And a lot of people can relate to parts of that. Absolutely. In fact, I think it's, I think he's credited as pop on streaming platforms. I mean, I used to hate the word pop. I still don't really like the word pop. Yeah. I don't, it just gives me like soda, you know. Ugh. But popular is fire. Like, oh, like, 
what is this it's just popular like that's lit yeah that's a goal you know to be to be looked at like nina simone and carol king and elton john they're classics that other people want to sing yeah. you know like carol king literally put will you still love me tomorrow and you make me feel like a natural woman on her album and they were made even more famous by other artists because her songs were just that fire yeah you know i want to be on that level one day that would be fire like i just I'm so inspired by artists that put their all into the song, you know, because those are things that that will outlive me. Like, I don't know my time on this earth. I don't know what impact I'll make or if whatever, I don't think about that. But this music that I make, I want it to be able to serve something like you know for someone because music has the power in my mind when i listen to a song it can literally change my whole energy mm. you know i could listen to carol king's beautiful and just feel like okay i need to smile it's okay i know i'm sad right now and lonely but i gotta make myself smile because that'll release some endorphins and i'll feel a little bit better or like I'll listen to a Nina Simone song, um, The Other Woman, or <sighs> damn, I put a spell on you and it just gives me an energy that, I don't know, that makes me feel more <sighs> just like a natural woman goddess. Like I have all of the power, like I understand my power. Yeah. And that is brilliant. That is brilliant. You know, there's so many people I understand around me, especially being in Atlanta and like on the scene and like out and about that numb their feelings, that do not want to face their feelings, do not want to creep into those dark crevices of where their mind can go. And so they just numb it and drink. And I, can relate i've been there i do that to it sometimes but we cannot allow that to like be just accepted all the time like it's a beautiful thing to have an introspective moment it's like medicine it's organic medicine you know what i'm saying and i'm not saying that i know everything about everything because i'm still a learning growing human being that is gonna fuck up sometimes and so i just feel as though the best thing that i can do is be honest about that and show it in my music because it's okay to fuck up it's okay to not have everything together and just be easy on yourself and like <sighs> take a deep breath like it's cool you yeah. know with the production process I, I thought it was interesting because i hadn't really imagined that it was made on a obviously everything's made on a computer but i didn't think of it being kind of made in logic like that because it sounds so live and so like analog i wondered what your process is for making the instrumental side of it so part is uh logic you know we would record instruments live yeah. instruments into logic so that was just the doll you know holding all the information um i recorded strings on analog at revival at complex on like the original mic that earth wind and fire would use right which is crazy. And Jasmine Fire, she recorded strings. Paris Strother did the arrangements. Like, we had viola, violin, cello. It was unreal vibes going on when I think about it. It was just like, wow. So, 
And then also I mastered the whole album with Bernie. His last name was Cape Sooner. Bernie Grunman. Okay. And so he like mastered Thriller and right. just a whole bunch of like legendary albums himself. He did this and like he has his own mastering houses in like Tokyo, LA, New York. I think one here. And so it was a complete honor and just crazy to watch because he has his own console um, that he uses to do it. And it's like all analog equipment right. with like the original computer type thing. I was just like, this is crazy. So I'm really excited more than anything to get a few vinyl copies of it because he taught me or at least I learned from him that on streaming services even if you buy the album on iTunes that's the closest that you'll get but it's still lossless quality like yeah you're gonna lose some of what you get from the actual master but when you get it on vinyl that's the only like time you don't lose any right of the quality of what the masters are like when you get it done and so, I don't know, throughout this whole process, I've really fallen in love with the whole process, like using hardware, using analog, which mics I'm on, like compressors, reverbs, J37s. I love all of this shit. Yeah. <laughs> like, just like i actually use like a natural reverb like the actual what a reverb looks like which is like this box with a lever right and i'm just like this is so cool yeah. like i just feel like a nerd all over again but it makes me excited to like know what the waves are doing like being able to manipulate those things and it's like painting like painting a picture yeah you know i love it but when you talk about beats that you've made is that stuff that you're like making in the laptop or oh yeah that's all done in my like apartment yeah in my room just making beats and things of that nature um i really want to get an upright or a whirly matt martians from the internet was the person that put in my mind planted the seed in my mind like i need to have a home studio yeah like it doesn't matter if it's small and quaint like but just to be able to articulate my my vision like bare bones first if even it's bare bones because sometimes it'll be the full idea and you don't want to change it but so i have a little setup in my house like yeah where i just record on logic yeah so on the songs where you started with a beat that you've made in your laptop do you then kind of record live stuff into that and or did they kind of stay as the, as the they were well um i had a lot of songs that i started on logic and then i would bring in like bueno um he's my md now by the way but yeah he would come and like play bass and guitar or like someone would play drums like tim would like try to reinterpolate my keys and be like mm, this isn't fine like that let's help you and i'm like bro just chill like you know what i'm saying but yeah i love the art of making different beats or whatever i think that my thing the things that i make on logic have a very signature quality about them and so i started just using stock sounds so now i've graduated right to like archeria and different packs like bundles and things like that and waves and so my shit is like really fine now I'm excited. I'm very excited. I read something where you were talking about like in like earlier on in your career, I'm guessing you were just having to make the most of like a three hour studio session. Oh, yeah. How do you how do you make sure that you kind of get as much as you can out of 
I, I'm assuming that's like a financial thing, right? You've paid for like X amount of hours. Yep. That was my first few trips to LA. Um, the sessions were like oh, 80 an hour. And I would just, a lot. Okay, that's what I have. But it made me very like impulsive and quick-witted. And so, um, Show You, the song that's on my album was done in that slot of time and my friend my now friend i love her so much coco came through coco oh she's the best she's from quadrant and she's literally one of my favorite voices of all time coco a time me like did that in that slot because you you begin to n not care and like keep going back and forth with yourself about what you're gonna do. And so I appreciate three hour sessions, like getting out the raw idea, coming back, do another maybe an hour to like clean up, like think it over at night, clean it up, whatever. I actually heard from No ID, I met him yesterday or just reconnected with him yesterday. And he was just telling me about how like, Artists like Frank Sinatra and Aretha Franklin would go in and only do like three takes of a record and be like, you know, to the band, all right, now y'all figure it out. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like they don't think about all of, oh, I have to do this right and punch in and do that. Like that's when you just start to just overthink everything and it becomes dumb. Like I don't want to, I don't want to lose the raw quality of the life of the song so sometimes i'll overdo it like i'll do like 10 15 takes or something of a record but i'll always go back to like the first or second take yeah because it had that uncertainty or that just the original energy you yeah. know it's funny i heard that same thing about future i heard mm. that with future it's like he goes in and freestyles gets all the stuff out and then it's up to like Metro Boomin and Esco or whatever to like put the song <laughs> together. It's fine. I mean, that's something I think I also learned in Atlanta. Like Childish put me on game to that because that was my first session where he was just like, all right, just go in the booth first. I'll play the beat and just you just go. Like I didn't even hear the beat or whatever. He was just like, just do it. It's like, oh, okay. Because I would usually just be in a corner writing my whole thing. But I don't usually work like that anymore. I like to um, listen to it for a little while and go in with a melody and then kind of put words. But it's a very impulsive. I want the first thought to shine through Yeah. for the most part, you know. I read something where you said that you like to go in the studio with like an empty slate. And I wondered if there's ever a risk or anxiety that comes with doing that because you might not you might not get anything out of the session. I mean, there are some sessions where I don't get anything out. I always get something out, but I'll know if I'm going to use it or not pretty much by the end of the day. Because most of the songs, I think all of the songs, Besides like artifacts and yeah, besides artifacts, for the most part, all of those songs were done same day. Like go in, do everything, record it, and then it's up to the engineer and like we'll clean it up, you know, and post. Yeah. Artifacts, I just lost the session so many times. <laughs> Who the ghetto. That was the ghetto. Oh, in the ghetto with that that was a state of mind the ghetto basically because everyone around me was so nice they were like okay you can come search for it but that was when i didn't realize how to really save things in my hard drive so i cut that song like four times right in different places it was a lot so with the album with to myself at what point did you know that you were making an, an album, was that like an intention from the start or was it just that you had songs that were starting to kind of come together? 
I did not start with the intention of making an album. Um, we had, I was going to do like small EPs or whatever, but when I came to my managers, Mitch and KJ, we were at Stankonia and we were just having a little powwow and I introduced them to Tim, um, who is like the exact producer of the album along with me now. Um, and I showed them some of the work we were creating and like a coupled with the stuff that I had with Itai. This was like really early on, like last year or something. Not really early on. I think it was like mid last year. Right. And they were just like, yo, I think we have to like abandon the plan <laughs> and just this music is too good. Like, you should just make it into a body of work. And I was just like, okay, I'm here for it. Like, and so, because we realized that there were a lot, it was a plethora of songs. Like, it was going to be longer than an EP, you know. It was going to be at least eight or nine or ten songs or something, which ended up being, you know, I think ten is our own album. And so... We didn't want to stop that, and they were all like long and lush, even in the demo phase. You know, it was fire. Yeah. So. And it's obviously like there's a there's a breakup at the center of this album. I wondered like where the relationship was when you started recording. Is it is was it something that kind of deteriorated throughout the process, or had it already ended when you started the record? It had already ended when I was like, even before I had met Tim Maxi, um, I was just, it was like the top of January last year and we had broken up officially in like May, but br prior, like I had known it was ended, but it was like a delusional phase of like, no, this is fine, everything is fine. <laughs> like, so yeah i was just working aimlessly and just trying to get all of the emotions out you know <sighs> yeah. but i think that you've written a it's a breakup album but it's more about you than like your partner and it's it feels like it's kind of more of an empowering and uplifting listen it's not like petty it's not like finger pointing it's none of that i wondered how you ensured that that was the feeling of the record and whether there was other records that you looked at as inspiration for that i wanted to intentionally make the track listing feel like a back and forth because to this day i don't know like i go back and forth in my mind sometimes and i know that's horrible oh my god but it's just like, I'll get really low sometimes and be like, damn, what have I done? What has happened or whatever? And that's really bad, but that's just honest. Like, But it is about me. It wasn't about him. Like, it, He was a definite safety net, you know? And I think I put all my eggs in that basket and I realized that even when we would be on vacation and, you know, he had made a lot of success for himself. It was amazing. I think I was still unhappy. I didn't feel fulfilled. It would be those moments when I'm in LA and me and my brother are staying in like a motel and I've lost everything. And But I'm still doing music and spending all of my money and being broke as hell and out here that I felt a rush and like fulfilled and completely on point in my purpose. I wasn't getting that when I was with him. Um, I just felt like confined. And so that's no shade to him either. Like, even though he was pretty trash at the end of the relationship, I mean, I think that was God by the way, when it fell out the way it did. Because sometimes, for me, I will let things linger 
and the ambience before it would have to be something something really like nail it in the coffin for it to be okay it's over you know yeah. i can't do this anymore but yeah it was about my personal growth because i had to really be sure and certain that this is i'm doing this for me like i'm not going to be on this wave of this delusional housewife reality that isn't real it's not made of anything it's not based off of any facts like i can't control another person or what they want or what they need for themselves all i can bet on is me you know in this lifetime and so i had to have faith that things would happen if i step out on faith for myself and I had a pretty bad nightmare too that like showed me like at 40 years old moving back to Fayetteville and like leaving my family and like just kind of running away. It wasn't Fayetteville, it was like more desolate South, like a place unknown and like working at a grocery store and just this like reality where I had lived and did the whole wife thing and that shit still failed but it failed like later on in life and so I was just lost and I left my family and I was like depressed as hell so that kind of shook me and made me realize like instead of being afraid of those things I'll just shine a big light on it and I'll make an album about it and yeah. I'll, you know, perform and be angry about it and get it all out of me. Like, you know, because I'm not about to settle. I can't do that, you know. I know that as well, recording it was pretty unorthodox and there was some, literally some lost sessions, some deleted sessions. Did you have a laptop stolen at one point as well? And I wondered like how, I mean, you can you can tell the story of it as well, but I wondered how it felt to have like your creations literally taken away from you. Uh, it was at a time when I was at the Dreamville sessions, so this is like the height of everything for me at the moment. You know, I had snuck in. I had made myself known. I met J. Cole, reconnected with Ari Lennox, was doing my thing, like going crazy. Everyone was like, oh, Rose, like we just figured out who you are. Like, oh, shit. Like they were discovering me. It was like a vibe and it felt like family. Like, and I was so happy. And he was in Brazil, my ex at the time, living his best life. And we got into an argument over money, which was so disturbing. Like, I think I had owed him like $700 or some shit. And mind you, this is somebody that has buku money from whatever, you know. It was never about that. It was about control or just, I don't know what was brewing inside of him because we weren't together. I don't know. And at Tree Sound, there is no service. So I was like, okay, I'll send you the money, whatever. But I didn't have any service and I forgot about it. I was like, oh, my friends, like whatever. And so I was just started recording music and doing my thing and then left at five in the morning, crashed. And I woke up to my roommate, like knock banging on my door. Like she had left from work to come over. And she was like, you know, Rob is trying to get in touch with you, like, or whatever. He's threatening to delete all of your stuff. Like, he has all of your stuff hijacked. And this man literally, like, deleted my Dropbox, deleted my Instagram, was, like, going to clear out all of my bank accounts, deleted all of my emails. Like, it was a horror story. It was, and so I went on Twitter and I was just like, disclaimer, 
my ex has gone crazy. I don't know what's going on. Because I didn't know if he was going to do some crazy thing. Like, you know, I don't know. I would never seen him like this. So I thought he was like on drugs or something. Like this was completely out of my world. Like my time with him. And so he lost it. He literally lost it and was like threatening me and all of this kind of thing. And I was just like crying uncontrollably and had to like go put a halt on all of my things that I had left but all of that music all of that shit was gone literally all I had left was the album right because I had backed it up and given it to my managers Mitch and KJ and Bueno he had a copy and so that was all I had. It was like this album. It's crazy when I think about it. He really went for everything that I loved because that was music. Like, I mean, I still have stuff that I had with Case, but I had like 50, not 50, maybe 30 songs or whatever yeah. that I had recorded that were intentionally maybe for the, the next album or whatever. Like, because they were just a slew of songs that I was creating in between the records that I have on the album and they're gone. All of those sessions yeah. are gone. And I could say that I'm mad or whatever, but I've already started on the next. So it sounded really brilliant. It just sucks. But that was the moment that I really realized like, okay, this is over. Like, you went for the jugular. You really tried to kill me. Yeah. My guy, like, kill off my things. Because what if there was no backups? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. it would just be over. Like, he was super trash for that. To this day, I don't understand. How important has community been for you? Because it feels like, obviously, from the stuff we were saying about Fairville at the start of the conversation to the Dreamville sessions to also... I guess the thing of being an independent artist who is going to need help to put an album together. How important has community been in your career so far? Community is essential. I mean, because especially I realized that in the Dreamville sessions, like when I came in and I saw my friends that I had worked with, like on the low or just supported, like Childish Major, Young Baby Tate, uh, Saint Beauty, everybody is just there, and like, I'm like, oh, what's good? Like my friends, like seeing them around, and just the support is unreal. Like we have to support one another, like help each other climb up, and we're all in our own lanes. So it's just like I see you, like I appreciate this, and we get together and just hang out and talk and have conversations about what we go through um in Atlanta especially I feel really blessed to be like in a dope community like in a solid community whether it's artists that are you know musical artists or like painters visual artists like my friends uh Vivian Chavez she is toots Nicole, who shot my cover, like the photographer, she's an incredible photographer. And like Sage is a painter, Manny is a painter. Like I love, I, I'm inspired by all of that in every regard. And so it's important to surround yourself with, like, and be able to sharpen each other, you know? So I love that. And Fayetteville is lit because they gave me a warm embrace like as a kid yeah like i felt that my school you know the radio station the news station the newspapers like they championed me and so when i met cole i felt like like i have to be here like i don't care i'm sinking in no one understands you know but he does and he built that from fayetteville like and even having conversations with him, like, our stories are so similar. You know, the introvert, like, energy just 
is through figuring out all of the things like throughout high school and like knowing things about where I wanted to be, but also having like people that were OGs like just champion you and like give you that space to develop and grow on your own, like come into your own. That shit was essential. And that's how we're able to build something, a foundation that is lasting and that for me, like I want it to last. I want to be built to last. And I think that all of those years and formative time like from my community having that is be is, is why it's so palpable now you know yeah you're obviously getting to tour the record with <clears throat> you toured with Ari Lennox in the US and Snow Allegra in the UK and the US next right mm -hmm. and last night you got to play Amy Winehouse song in London yeah. so how's how's that been it's been incredible like this is unreal the Ari Lennox tour was incredible. It felt like family. And Snow is just so beautiful, such a beautiful spirit. Like being able to see all of the countries that I've been to, like all of the places, like Amsterdam is so fire. Stockholm and Copenhagen are just just so different. It just interesting. And so fire, it's like a different world. The cobblestone, the vibes in Paris and London are incredible, but they have that odd familiarity to places that I've been. But it just lets us, it lets me know that, you know, in a lot of ways, like, we all have so much in common. You know, that's certain things that you wouldn't get unless you were there. And so I'm blessed to be able to travel and do this, like, with my best friends, with my team. Like, my roommate Chattel is now, like, my day-to-day -day manager. And I think I took that from, um, like, looking at people like Rihanna and J. Cole who have their teams that are very filled with people that are trustworthy, that they trust, you know? My managers, Mitch and KJ, were there before there was any type of anything. Like, there was no music yet. There was just what I had prior. And so I'm very blessed to be in such a very uh, comforting environment as I begin to travel and, you know, broaden the spectrum and things like I love this. This journey has been lit so far. What are you most proud of about what you've achieved so far? I'm proud of being able to get my homies' passports and us be on tour around Europe. So far, that's like top achievement for me because we thugged it out, our Linux tour, like... It was beautiful, like every show made it worth it, but like in between, it was like us in a van through 24 different cities around the country. And it, it was crazy, like there were times, like everyone got sick at one point. We are staying in some crazy places. It got crazy, it's like the van got broken into. But as things progressed, like, this run was like, of course, we're here for work and we're doing shows and one offs. But the reward, like it feels like when you've put in those that time to really sharpen and you come and, you know, it was still like staying up till five in the morning, like getting it right in Germany, like experimenting with different ideas because performing in Europe is a different vibe than in yeah. the States, like completely different vibe i would say outside of london and like because london gives me the boisterous type energy but right everyone's so quiet and like it's not really about hype and like you know what i'm saying getting everybody hyped up everyone seemed to really be more pleased with the song itself so it was like pulling back all of that energy and stripping it down and 
we we've got to travel and see that for ourselves and like do it and so that shit is lit yeah and so i'm very proud of that perfect and lastly what does success look like to you success looks like Peace and happiness, first and foremost. Happiness, I know, is subjective, but peace of mind, balance, mentally. Achieving that, first and foremost, it looks like God being the epicenter, like being spiritually grounded. And um, it looks like being able to live fruitfully, you know, not having to worry about finances for the most part you know like those things being covered i don't need an excess of like oh i want this i need that like that's not balance by the way like that's not what i really need it's also being able to hear my music is helping other people through what they want to get through like Also, another little asterisk is I want to be able to write songs that stand throughout time. And I know that's the part that I won't know because I'll be dead, obviously. But, like, if other artists want to sing my songs and, like, things of that nature, then I feel like, okay, I've made it to another level. Thank you for listening to Making Conversation with Grant Bryden featuring Baby Rose. If you like this episode, then please be sure to rate, comment and subscribe wherever you're listening to podcasts. You can find Baby Rose at Baby Rose Music on social media and be sure to listen to her debut album to myself. You can find me on social media at Grant Bryden. Thank you to Kiki where this series of Making Conversation was recorded.